So Jasleen, give me a notice or wonder that you had. Okay, so both X and Y start at zero, zero. So instead of writing that all out, I'll just work with it. Both of these are starting at zero. What part of the graph is that called? The origin and the y intercept are both correct. Also, the x intercept is also correct, but they have the origin in the table. Um, Dinah, have another notice or wonder? Everyone have like at least a few that you're called on. Don't want to spend too long on this because we do have a quiz like the last 25 minutes. We'll come back to you, Dinah. So, Liana. Okay, 16 times 4 is 64. Is that consistent throughout? Like, is it times in 4 each time? Okay, but that is something to notice. Um, does anyone have a notice or wonder that they really want to share? Jack? Okay. You're thinking it's exponential. Why are you thinking it's exponential? Okay. So maybe exponential isn't the right word for it, but we are multiplying in the pattern. So I'm not going to write that it's exponential because for it to be exponential, it has to be like times four, times four, times four, times four, each being each output. But multiplying is involved somehow. Um, what's the type of function we've been really focused on lately for this team? Anyone remember what it's called? Or can you tell me anything else about it? Like what it looks like, the equation for it. It's kind of recaps the past few days. John? A what? So that's our exponential function. So our exponential functions are still important. They're still going to be compared to these new type of functions. Does anyone remember what these new type of functions are called? Maybe like look around the room and get some of the assignment type. Okay, so quadratic functions are our main focus, honestly, until the end of the school year. We do have some state test scenes in there where we do review and things like that, but quadratic functions is unit six and seven. Do we remember the formula for quadratic functions? You would have had to watch the video or take the notes to see. Good. X to the second power is our like most basic quadratic function we could have. We actually call this the parent function because any other variation is still a quadratic function, but we need to have the x squared for it to be quadratic. So like if it's x cubed, it's no longer quadratic. x to the fourth is no longer quadratic. If the exponent on the x is a two, and that's the highest it goes, it'll make a graph that looks like what shape? I know I was there for that lesson. No excuses. What type of shape does an x squared graph make? Or a type of name? A U shape. So it'll either look like this, which if it's a positive x squared, it will. It'll be up like a smile. And look at the graphic for you so that you can verify if that's the right equation. Um, or it could be down like a frown, and if it is, it's because that x squared is negative. So if that's a negative x squared, still u shape, it's just going the other way. And there's other stuff we could do to this u shape too, like we could add other terms involved, and then that'll make it move a certain way and things like that. But right now, our main focus is if it has x squared in it, it's going to make it u shape. 
So that's just like a recap from the past few days. Um, but other notices and wonders about this table. Does it appear to be quadratic? Okay, maybe. Does anyone know what the formula would be? That would be kind of a bit more of a challenge, but I'm interested. Usually there's always one page here that knows it. Um, as far as seeing if it's a quadratic or not, since we have both columns increasing, so like the Y's are also increasing, that could have been one of your notices. I'm not seeing yet that it's quadratic. Like you could think it's exponential, but then we know it's not because it's not a consistent exponential pattern. I have to see if there's parts where it increases and decreases. Yeah. Yes, Reiner? Is it y equals four squared? Okay. Y equals four squared for which part? We're, we're getting closer. Um, for it to be the right equation, it would have to be no matter what I plug in for the X, I'm getting these outputs. So I don't think it's four squared. If you look at our equation, the X has to be what's attached to the two. Does that make sense? Um, so there's something else going involved. What it is, I don't know. Like maybe if I write it like this and put other things next to it, you can figure it out. But I'd be really impressed if you came up with the form. Um, are there any other notices and wonders that anyone wants to share? Diana, did you come up with me? When I do 64. Oh, okay, so from here to here, I could add 80. Am I adding 80 throughout? No, so it's also not a linear pattern. So that's something else to notice. You usually start seeing if it's linear, then move on seeing if it's exponential. We know that it's not either. So you could put that as a notice. We know that this is not linear. It's not adding the same amount each time. We know that it's not exponential. It's not multiplying the same amount each time. So a wonder could be, is this quadratic? Until I know the formula, I won't know. But we'll see probably in the next one, you'll see that. Uh, one more thing, I just wanna share like what the book had for notices and wonders that you guys might've noticed. The values of X increase by one as you move across the table, which we do or maybe you don't, I don't know, but it's always nice when they do that because then it's usually easier to see what pattern there is if any. the X is increased by one each time. Another notice, all Y values are even numbers and divisible by four, eight, and 16. So that 16 was very interesting when it was set. All of these numbers are divisible by 16. If you divide them by 16 or eight or four, you will get a whole number. Another notice, the Y values are all perfect squares. Do you know what that means? Mm -hmm. So you could memorize, a lot of teachers will make you memorize like the first 12 perfect squares so that you can recognize them. Um, but another way to tell is if you can square root that number, and if it gives you a whole number, then it's a perfect square. So like the square root symbol looks like this. Square root of zero is zero. Um, square root of 16 is what? Good. Square root of 64 is Square root of 144 is 12. And that's usually what people remember up to. But then if you test these other ones, square root of 256 is 16, and square root of 400 is. So these are all perfect squares. Cool thing. 
So that's probably going to be quadratic then since we're making perfect squares. Um, things you might wonder, is there a rule? Is this quadratic? And things like that. But any questions so far? All right, let me briefly read you like the goal of today. And this lesson is called Building Quadratic Functions to Describe Situations, Part 1. There will be a Part 2 and Part 3. So that'll probably actually be our whole week is referring to these as real world situations. So today, specifically, we're going to measure falling objects. Now, we know our graphs for quadratics either look like this or like this. When something's falling in the real world, does it usually go back up? So then it's probably not going to be like this U shape necessarily that we're talking about today. It's going to be more so this one, the one that's like inverted. Um, so keep that in mind. The situations we're talking about, whether it's being dropped, thrown, are quadratic functions. We're going to make the formula for them. We're going to do that. So by the end of the lesson, or at least we'll do as much as we can before I have to make you quiz, but you're going to explain the meaning of the terms in a quadratic expression that represent the heights of a falling object and using tables, graphs, and equations to represent the height of a falling object. I'm recording right now. I did teach it a bit differently last year with different examples. So if you want to check that out, it's there. Puzzle piece is lesson five. And again, this will probably be like the last time I can remind you, but if you're going to get full points on your most recent binder check, you'll definitely want to resubmit that. Anytime I'm not teaching, show it to me and I'll update that grade. Uh, that's the only thing in the 20% category right now. And that will be the only thing until our next binder check, which is scheduled for Thursday, March 7th. So keep that in mind. What else about that? I'm still grading your test. Sorry, it's been taking me a while. It's been very busy. So there's that. Hopefully by today I'll have at least the 100 point part updated, but Working as hard as I can. Questions on anything? So you'll know it's updated once you see that comment that says retake given during class, higher two scores given. If you weren't here for the retake, which was Wednesday last week, it was Tuesday last week, then I'll pull you from class at some point to take it starting Wednesday. So that fine, you can do it. But on to the activity that's directly related to the learning targets. A rock is dropped from the top floor of a 500 foot tall building. The camera captures the distance the rock traveled in feet after each second. How far will the rock have fallen after six seconds? So notice it gives you some values right here. If it helps to sort it out into the table, then I think that would be a good technique. We're comparing seconds and feet. So between those two variables, what should be the X, the seconds or the feet? Seconds. Seconds, X is almost always time. So that means Y should be the feet, which is dependent on how much time has passed. So maybe that'll help you figure out what the distance traveled in is after six seconds is what it's asking for. Also keep in mind like the real world elements. Maybe like a minute or so to figure that out yourself. How much will it have traveled after six seconds? Uh, come back to you for something else then. Lauren, what about you? Do you have an answer for how far the rock traveled after six seconds? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, 576. Does anyone have a different answer than that? Jack? Uh, yeah, 784. 784. Other, um, like, wait, 500. Any other answers you want to throw out there? Okay. Now, Jaden, why 500? Not saying you're wrong. Yes, why 500? Before you answer that, maybe let me tune in the class and see what's going on. Um, notice that as the rock got closer to the ground, every second it traveled more feet than the second before, right? So like from here to here, I want to say that was 48 feet that it added. From here to here, that was 80 feet. From here to here, 256 minus 144. It added 112 feet, or traveled 112 feet in that second. So each time it goes down, it's like traveling faster almost. But why from 400 are we ending at 500? Okay. Okay. Is there a consistent pattern in the adding class? So I will tell you the answer is 500 feet. But why is it 500 feet? Brooklyn? Okay, good. The building is 500 feet tall. So I guess the maximum it could have traveled from the top of the building to the bottom of the building is 500 feet. And like we said, as we keep, as time continues to pass, it's adding quite a bit more or traveling quite a bit more per second. So when we're going from second five to second six, we can assume that it will have reached the ground by six seconds. Make sense? And we're not counting like, I don't know, I'm assuming if you drop a rock from that height, it kind of bounces a little bit. We're not including like the bounce. Just it traveled 500 feet, it would have hit the ground by that time. Now, number two, but hold on to these other answers. You might see them again later. For this real world example, the limit is the height of the building for how far it travels. Now, Jada noticed that the distances fallen are all multiples of 16. Also notice that with the exception of like the six input, the rest of these are from your notice and wonder. So Jada noticed that all the distances fallen are multiples of 16. Like 16 is 16 times one, 54 is 16 times four, 144 is 16 times nine, and so on. So they all have a 16 in, col in common. And then she looked at the numbers that they didn't have in common that almost seem a bit random. The so one, four, nine, 16, and 25. And she noticed that they're all perfect squares, right? That's one squared, two squared, three squared, four squared, and five squared. So then noticing that, the next thing would be to see how much the rock fell after seven seconds, assuming that now we're talking about a building that's tall enough. So take away that it's 500 feet tall now. So that 500 answered number one. We're now adjusting the situation. Now the building is like taller. You don't know how tall, but it's taller. Continuing that pattern, find what it should be then for six seconds and then finally seven seconds. Keeping Jada's observation. 
If you're feeling really confident, confident, start making the equation, which is part B, for the function with B representing the distance dropped after T seconds. Follow Jada's observations. It looks like all of the inputs are definitely being squared. So let's square the six. What six squared? Thirty six. Because when you square something, that's six times six, right? So thirty six. And then what they're doing with it afterward to get the rest of the inputs is they're taking that thirty six and multiplying it by sixteen. That's what happens. That's how we got these outputs. So then when we do 36 times 16, that is where we're getting that number 576 from. I think someone said it earlier. Yeah. And that's following the pattern. Assuming now that the building's tall enough. Okay, so we're continuing the pattern. Your task was to find after seven seconds so Angelina, do you have for after seven seconds? Eighty-four or ninety-four? Okay. And that we got from doing seven squared, which is forty-nine, timesing it by sixteen, and that is seven eighty-four if I remember correct. It's still a quadratic because it well, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, the next part is to make the equation. So remember, when we do this, and this always throws people off, you have to look at the math that we did. Like, the things that are staying the same each time would say numbers in our equation. The things that are changing or varying each time, you would represent with a variable. So in each situation, what are we doing to the input? We're definitely squaring it. And the input is changing each time. So I'm going to use a variable and I'll have to change it to what variable they like in a second. But for each situation, we are squaring the input. But that's not all. What are we doing with it afterward? Multiplying it by 16. That could be our equation. And that's giving us the output, the y. Or if we're using the variables we told us to use, it's t squared times 16 equals t. Okay. That gives us the rule for the table, which is a bit challenging, I'll admit, because how would you know that is also being multiplied by 16? We'll give you easier ways later on. But that's just like what we discovered. There is a rule. You can do other things to the x squared, and it's still a quadratic. Questions on that? I'm going to switch to the next page in a second. <laughs> so in this unit, anytime it talks about something being dropped, something being thrown, that makes a U-shaped path. So this. If you think about it, um, if we're dropping it from a building, it kind of goes in this pattern where it goes up a little bit and then just straight down. That we call projectile motion, so still a quadratic function. This you might have learned about in physics or will learn, but Galileo, an Italian scientist, studied the motion of free falling objects. The law they discovered can be expressed by this equation, which is the same thing that we made. Granted, we did t squared times 16. Same difference, right? It gives us the distance fallen in feet as a function of time in seconds. So this, if you are told to make an equation that resembles that situation, and it's talking about something being dropped, that 16 needs to be attached to the x squared. That's part of it. It's like something with gravity. 
I don't know much more about it than that, but it's always in the equation. So if I want to know how far does it fall in 0.5 seconds, I would do this math. I would plug it into this equation. 16 times 0.5 to the second power. And then use my calculator from there. If you're trying to do things, I don't know, in your head or breaking it up in your calculator, remember that you have to do exponents before you multiply. So I have to do the 0.5 squared Which is 0.25 uh, times 16, I get four. That is how much it traveled or it fell after 0.5. Now take a look at these two tables. Might be better viewing on your paper. This small nice screen I can use it. But both Elena and Diego are talking about the same thing. They're talking about an object in the first few seconds after it was dropped. Elena's comparing it using distance fallen as the output. So kind of like our previous example, how much it fell after a certain amount of time. And Diego's is distance from the ground. Do you see like the difference there? Distance from the ground is the highest when the time has just started. And then to go from here to here, I added 16. From here to here, I'd be subtracting 16 if we're talking about the distance from the ground. Um, Know that where your x intercept is when we're talking about distance from the ground is your starting height. I would probably circle this. Diego's has the starting height in the circle. And it did say that an object was dropped from a height of 570. You can use Elena's table, like you can use the rule that we came up with, 16t squared, to get all of these answers. You'll notice it's even already kind of the same that we already had. Like t squared is 4, 4 times 16 is 64, 3 squared is 9, 9 times 16 is... 144. 4 squared is 16. 16 times 16 is 256. So, so far matching the same, even though we're talking about a different object now. So, we're talking about distance at Bell is 16 t squared. When we're talking about distance from the ground, we're basically having to subtract how much it traveled for each distance it was at. So this was minus 16. This was minus 48, which over here it added 48 of the three in the pattern. I want you to fill in three and four on Diego's table. So we know how much it traveled each time. We will need its height at each time. And then see if you can make the equation yourself. Otherwise, I'll just tell you um, we do have to quiz in a few minutes. So you just a little bit to try that yourself. After break. Okay, so Kaden, what'd you get for Diego's table at three seconds? How far is the item from the ground? All right, so in the green, I did this while my screen was frozen. I figured out how much it traveled each second because obviously you have to subtract that amount. 
for each second on Diego's table. It is getting closer and closer to the ground. So 512 minus 80 is 432, good. And then pull in, what about at four seconds? Good. So that's what you should have had to complete the table. Then the equation will have to be different. So in each situation, it's like the same amount, except that we're subtracting it. So what should my equation be then? Jack? Uh, 576 t squared. 576 minus 16 t squared. Good. That's literally what we did each time. Um, we saw our starting amount in our formula to give me the distance from the ground. We got to know like where my starting height was. And each time we subtracted this amount, which was 16 t squared. Ordinarily, you'll see it more where it looks like this, I guess, like as a general setup, like as negative 16 t squared plus 576. Both are correct. But I think this one probably will make more sense to you right now. But it's not that and that's where we have to end it today because uh, I think it's small little thing. Probably will have free time. If not, we can like the whole 20 minutes on it. Any questions though on today's lesson?